Hello, everyone from beautiful Minneapolis, Minnesota and Denver, Colorado, where Brett is uh, stationed for this conference. Uh, we are so excited to welcome you to the final session of today's quality conference. Uh, I don't know about you, Brett, but today has absolutely flown by. What an incredible way, at least for me, to kick off my weekend. How about you? Yeah, I mean, it's been amazing. I feel very educated and uh, motivated to dive in more into a lot of these topics that we've covered. So there's a lot that we can look into going forward and I'm excited. So it's been a great day. Awesome. Agreed. And we have heard from some dynamic speakers today and saved a great topic for last. I love a good fact or fiction discussion, and that's what we are about to embark on. Craig Wallace is back with us for this final round of the Prove It, a Spotlight on Sterile Processing Quality virtual event. If you did get the chance to hear our introduction of Craig this morning, he is a highly sought after contributor in national and international standards organizations specific to disinfection and sterilization of medical devices. He's currently serving as the chair of the ISO Biological Indicator Committee and is considered a U.S. technical expert in ISO for chemical indicators and steam sterilization. For this final session, Craig is going to discuss all things chemical indicators. He's going to break down the facts and the fiction on design and on the technologies that exist. He'll also examine the current recommended practices for use of chemical indicators and discuss their common misconceptions. I'm excited to round out the day with this presentation. So let's welcome back Mr. Craig Wallace. Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to our webinar today on chemical indicators, facts versus fiction. So again, my name is Craig Wallace, and I'm sponsored at the Beyond Clean Prove It conference today by 3M. And I am required to show a disclaimer. So you can read through this, um, disclaiming some of the information in here. All right, now that we're done with that, let's, let's dive in. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, we're going we're gonna to focus on chemical indicators. Um, we'll start with a review of designs and technologies, just to sort of ground ourselves in that, that information. Then we're going to discuss the different types of chemical indicators and their applications. We're going to look at the current recommended practices and what they tell us about how to appropriately use chemical indicators and when to use them. And then we'll close with discussing some common misconceptions about chemical indicators. We'll do a bit of fact or fiction on some various scenarios. So we'll start with a definition like we often do. This is from the ISO standard that provides definitions of uh, sterilization and disinfection related terms. You can see that a chemical indicator is a test system that's based on measuring process variables and we'll talk more about those and then respond with a chemical or a physical change. They'll respond to that exposure. Chemical indicator designs. Well there's two kind of basic kinds if you think about it. One is a color change. So these types of indicators will have a ink that is reactive, that is it will react with some element of the sterilization process and it will change color. So white or cream to black is very common um, color, but there's, there's many other colors under the rainbow of different, different companies and different processes and different indicators, but the, the basic thing is color one going to color two after exposure to the process. The other kind of design is called a moving front. So some of these are designed where a, a chemical pellet that is contained inside of the indicator will actually melt in the process. So that's obviously going to be like a steam process, a high temperature process. And as this chemical melt, it'll travel uh, down a channel and a channel and across the window, and it will eventually cross a pass fail line. There are other types of moving fronts that have the same sort of appearance and that they'll have a, a window with a 
with a reaction. But in these, the reactive ink um, reaction actually moves across a window. So the, there's a restriction in how the sterilant gets in there. But the, the bottom line on the moving front on all of those is to try to make a design that's easier to interpret. So the idea is you can see if the color has crossed a line and whether it is a, a pass or a fail. And sometimes with color changes, they can be a little bit hard to determine. You know, is the color dark enough or is it the right shade? So that's the reason for for moving fronts. So to understand chemical indicators, I, I've got to get you some terms here because we're going to use these later when we describe how chemical indicators are designed and how they are uh, expected to perform. So the, the first term is endpoint. So again, there's a formal definition point of the observed change defined by the manufacturer occurring after the indicator has been exposed to the specified stated values. So I, I work in standards committees. I know why things are worded this way sometimes, but at least when I read through that, I don't necessarily know what they mean. So, so here's an easier way to look at it. So the end point is the point in which an indicator shows a pass result. So any time today that I'm using the word endpoint, you can substitute a pass. So you should think for a minute about those moving front indicators, just to be clear. Um, an endpoint on those moving front indicators is not all the way through the end of the window. The endpoint would be the pass line. So as soon as that dark color crosses the pass line, that indicator has reached its endpoint. Here's another important one, um, and you saw this already re referred to in the chemical indicator definition. So a critical variable, a chemical or physical attribute within the process, changes to which can alter its effectiveness. <clears throat> so these are parts of the process, and the uh, best way is to kind of look at some examples so you know what I'm talking about. So time, temperature, pressure, etc. These are these are process variables. And the difference between a process variable and a critical variable is that a critical variable, if you change it, um, say you reduce it, you reduce time, if that's a critical variable, you're going to directly change the lethality or the effectiveness of the process. So critical variables have a direct impact on how well the process works. Here's another one stated values. So this is the value or values of a critical variable, so there's that term, at which an indicator is designed to reach its endpoint. And we said reaching its endpoint means it's supposed to pass. So, so stated values will become important when we talk about the ISO standard, about how they define the performance for CI. So let's, let's look at it. So here's an example. So this is just made up. It's not a real indicator as far as I know, but uh, for instance, if this is a steam chemical indicator, um, the stated value is 135C, 3.2 minutes. So a way to interpret that is it's saying that that indicator must reach its endpoint or it must show a pass result if it's exposed to 135 degrees C steam for 3.2 minutes. So that is a stated value. So I've, I've made some reference to some of these standards. So let's dig into the, uh, the main standard that defines requirements for chemical indicators. And, and that would be this one. So this is ISO 11140 Part 1. And You'll notice in the little graphic there, I've got it labeled as ANSI AMI ISO. So this international ISO standard is uh, accepted by the U.S. And, and made also into a U.S. standard. So the, the standards are identical, the AMI standard and the ISO standard. <clears throat> so this standard is primarily for manufacturers of chemical indicators. So you're not going to have this standard sitting around in your department, probably. But we're going to go through some of the information today because it's useful for you to know 
what the manufacturers are supposed to be doing and and what some of the information they're giving you with their chemical indicators actually means. So the first thing is that this standard uh, puts indicators into six different types. So now I, I'll say that these types are not intended to be we'll say hierarchical. In other words, um, they're numbered one through six and it and a two is not better than a one, and a three is not better than a two. They are simply different categories of, of chemical indicators. So let's take a look at them. Type one chemical indicators are process indicators. They provide visual evidence of exposure to the process. That's all they're supposed to do. Type two chemical indicators are for specific tests, um, specific tests like bowie dick tests for steam autoclaves. Type 3 are single critical process variable. So there's your terms again, critical process variable. So these are these types of indicators are intended to respond to one of the critical process variables of a process. And here's another mouthful, a type 4 multi-critical process variable indicator. These are designed to respond to two or more of those process variables. And then we have type 5, integrating indicators, sometimes called integrators. So this type has to respond to all the critical variables of a process. It's, it should have, for steam, for instance, it needs to have three stated values over the sterilization range. So it, a single stated value is not enough. There has to be three of them. And the response is linked to a theoretical BI. It's built into the standard and how they have to be designed and tested um, with some calculations that relate it to a biological indicator. So this indicator is, is unique in having this response linked to a theoretical BI. Then the last one is the type 6. These are called emulating indicators, sometimes called emulators. So they again respond to all of the critical variables these are intended to be cycle specific. So they will state a stated value, like that example we had of, of 135 for three minutes, or I'm, I'm sorry, 2.4 minutes. So the, the point is, whatever the stated value of the type 6 is, it has to be, that has to line up with the sterilization process. These indicators are intended to be cycle specific. So in your department, if you have a half a dozen different say steam sterilization process is running, the type 6 is going to, you'll have to have a separate type 6 indicator for each process. So when these requirements are stated in the standard and the manufacturers have to test to them, that testing has to be done in a special piece of equipment called a resistometer. So again, here's another definition. It's a piece of test equipment designed to create specified combinations of physical and chemical parameters of a process. And that, that really doesn't say at all. What resistometers are are very, very tightly controlled test sterilizers. So they, are, they are meant to take as many variables out of a process as possible. So when you're testing an indicator, you can get a much clearer line of sight as to how that indicator is performing. So for instance, for a steam process, for a resistometer, the resistometer is designed to try to almost entirely eliminate the come up time and the come down time. So the chamber needs to reach temperature within seconds of the start of the process. And, and obviously that's not even close to reasonable for a large hospital sterilizer. But the idea is we want to test those indicators just in the actual uh, exposure conditions of, of the sterilizer. So these are not things you would be able to do in a ster sterile processing department that hospitals don't keep this type of equipment. So as soon as I tell you that, there's always an exception. And I'll say this, that Bowie-Dick uh, indicators, and you're familiar with those that are used to test pre-vacuum sterilizers, are not tested in resistometers. There's actually separate parts of this ISO standard, parts 3, 4, and 5, that are dedicated to requirements for Bowie-Dick indicators. 
and those test requirements are, are in those standards and they don't um, they don't use a resistometer. So you say the standard defines the performance requirements. Well how how does it actually do that? So we're gonna take a look at one. Uh, this will be we'll look at type four chemical indicators to say how does the standard define performance. So they will set it up in a table, usually, that's that's going to uh, give the uh, give the requirements for the manufacturer. So you look at this table. The first column when it says process is going to be related to the sterilization process. This standard is not uh, process specific. It's not just for steam or or peroxide. It's for all the processes. The second column. The test point is a little different. It's going to state two tests that would have to be done on that indicator. So what's called test point one. In test point one, the indicator must show a pass result. So it's defining how sensitive the indicator needs to be, and it needs to show a pass under the, these conditions. Test point two is going to be where the indicator must show a fail result. So it really defines the, the, the two points for the chemical indicator. It's got to fail at this point, and it's got to show a pass at this point. It doesn't address uh, areas in between where you could have a mixed response. It just defines the pass and fail points. And then the other columns are going to be critical variables. So here we're back to critical variables again that will be varied in this testing to achieve a pass or a fail result in the chemical indicator. So let's start with steam. So here you can see the requirements. If you look at test point one, remember we learned that test point one means an indicator to be a type four has to show a pass in those conditions. Well, the conditions it states are the stated value. Right? And that goes back to what we learned before about the stated value is where an indicator must show a pass. So the, for STEAM, for test point one, for type four, the test time has got to be whatever your stated value time is on the indicator. And same for the test temperature. Now the STEAM tests are going to assume saturated STEAM. Now, if you look at test point two, it's this is going to be the fail cycle. So it's going to make adjustments to the settings on the resistometer to basically reduce some of these critical variables, reduce those values with the idea of, of getting a fail result. So if you look at it for a steam type 4, you'd run the first test at the stated value, the second test the manufacturer would run, they would reduce the exposure time by 25 percent and they would reduce the exposure temperature by 2 degrees C. So if we go back to that that made up indicator that I stated, um, that was a 3.2 minutes at 135 C, the test on that one would be run at 25 percent less than 3.2 minutes and by my math using my fingers and toes I think that's 2.4 minutes and it would be run at two degrees less than 135 so at 133. So when you put that indicator into the resistometer and ran it for 2.4 minutes at 133 degrees centigrade it should show a fail. So this is really how the standard sets up bookends on pass fail testing. So it can do this for for other types of indicators. So if you take a look at at ethylene oxide, one of the differences you'll notice is that that process has more critical variables. Um, it has four of them, time, temperature, concentration, and relative humidity. So for this process, the standard anchors the relative humidity or it fixes it, freezes it at greater than 30 percent, and then you change the variables. So there you can see again the pass cycles in test point one, they need to be all at the stated value and test point two is um, subtracting from those stated values to some degree and it needs to show a fail. And it's the same thing for vaporized hydrogen peroxide. 
you'll notice that there is some variability because these processes are different, some variability in how much the temperature is reduced and such. But you look at type 4s, and one of the things to remember about this when we get a little further down the trail is, you know, reducing the test time by 25% is quite a lot. It, it's kind of a, a big window, several degrees centigrade and 25% in test time. So type 4 chemical indicators are um, not as... I don't know how should we say, not as specific. There's a lot of leeway in there between the pass and fail line. So that standard, the chemical indicator standard, also, uh, besides the performance requirements, also gives information on labeling. And this can be useful for you to know because, again, you're, you're at the receiving end of the chemical indicator. You've got the labeling in there. And if the manufacturer is claiming compliance to the standard, they're saying, hey, this meets, you know, uh, the, the standard. You can check and see if it meets the labeling requirements because if it doesn't meet the labeling requirements, it doesn't meet the standard. So, for instance, in there it will say that the indicator must be clearly labeled with the process it's intended to monitor. It's, it's like this... In, in, in a box, so like a steam or a VHDO or ethylene oxide, so there's a symbol there that must be shown on the labeling. And then the standard requires a lot of, of other information. So the indicator type, so is it a type 4, a 5, a 6? Um, the intended use, is it steam or vaporized hydrogen peroxide? Stated values, so obviously we just learned if it's a type 4 or a type 6, it's, it's going to have stated values on it, so the manufacturer needs to tell you what that is. Uh, description of the endpoint change, does it, is it a moving front and it has to cross a line or is it a certain shade of, of gray or, or blue that is the endpoint? Instructions for use in storage conditions. So a lot of information for the manufacturer to be compliant with the standard that needs to be provided to you. Excuse me, so exposure indicators um, have different applications. I'm sorry, chemical indicators have different applications. Um, they can be these exposure indicators or special equipment tests and pack indicators. So let's just take a quick swing through there and see what these things mean. So exposure process indicators or type 1 are there for one thing and one thing only and that's to help you Provide, help provide you with visual confirmation that a pack or package was exposed to a process. So it is only intended to prevent accidental use of a non-processed item. That anybody coming into the department from the OR um, will not it will be able to quickly realize that this this package, this load, had not been processed yet by seeing the uh, the indicators. The thing you have to remember on these is that. They do not provide information on the quality of the sterilization process, and we'll delve into that a little bit more. So they're not really intended to test the process. They're just intended to give you a quick reference. Type 2 chemical indicators, special equipment tests, these are all Bowie Dick. So it's restricted to steam, and it's the Bowie Dick test that you do daily to check the uh, pre-vacuum steam sterilizer. So pack indicators, chemical indicators are typically often, I should say, used inside of packages. And they're in there basically to provide information on the conditions, the physical conditions inside of packs and packages. And that's important to know, right, because that's where the instruments actually are. The different types of indicators provide different levels of information. So pack indicators are typically going to be 3, 4, 5, and 6, and I will say that I, I don't know of any type 3 indicators on the market anywhere. I don't think anyone makes those anymore. Um, the last revision of the standard and uh, the committee I was working in, there was some discussion about removing type 3s because they simply don't exist, but um, at the end of the day, they decided to leave it in the standard. But 4, 5s, and 6s are typically used uh, as pack indicators. And then the type 5s, again, are, are different. They're set apart because they're designed to respond to all the variables, um, but, but their response is also correlated to a BI. So they are kind of unique among the chemical indicators in that regard. So chemical indicators can be used inside of process challenge devices. Um, certainly 
biological indicators are typically used inside of them. Chemical indicators can be. So here's, here's the ISO uh, definition, and it, it's kind of another standard jargon definition. So bottom line for PCDs is it would, you can't always put all the indicators inside of a um, inside of a package. So for a biological indicator, it might be best to actually have them inside of packages. That's obviously not uh, financially feasible or practically feasible. And so all the process challenge device is intended to do is to act as if the indicators inside of it, be a biological indicator or a chemical indicator, were actually inside of a package. Only this can be retrieved in the sterile processing department, um, and the test can be can be looked at there if it's a BI or the chemical indicator can be inspected, and you can get information before the before the load leads your department. So PCDs are just convenience for testing. Okay, so we've learned a bit about how they're how they're specified and their designs and such. So so how do you use them? So in the U.S., we'll go back again to, to AMI documents, and I've selected two here. So AMI SC58 um, is for chemical sterilization, high-level disinfection, and information regarding how to monitor vaporized hydrogen peroxide sterilization process is contained in that standard. And then, of course, there's AMI ST79, which gives uh, information on STEAM processes. So these are, as they say, comprehensive guides. So they cover the processes front to back, um, every aspect of them. But they both contain valuable information on how to do quality control testing of these, of these various processes. So if we go into STEAM, and we're going to just focus on chemical indicators, and we're going to focus on on load release, so, um, no, I'm sorry, just look at STEAM for chemical indicators. The, uh, the different applications, so you've got Bowie-Dick, and the frequency of that for the Prevac sterilizers only is going to be daily. The external process indicators are intended to be on every single package that's sterilized, and obviously the most common type of external Chemical indicator is going to be indicator tape, but there's lots of other versions too. Pre-printed dots or dots that are applied. Um, basically, they've got to be on the outside and make it easy to see if the process, if the package had been processed or not. And then the the last one is internal chemical indicators, and they are supposed to be inside of every package, according according to Amy ST79. Now, in Steam, there is some a little bit more complexity in the use of chemical indicators regarding load release. So this is testing of the sterilizer when the load is in there in order to make your decision as to whether or not you can release that load for use on, on patients. That's load release. So load release is accomplished by putting indicators inside of a PCD. Uh, most of the time, that's going to be a biological indicator. But in Amy SC79, there are scenarios where chemical indicators are put inside PCDs as well. So as we know in Amy and STEAM, that they differentiate the quality plan for implant loads versus loads that don't contain an implant. That's just a risk-based system that says that implants, as far as contamination, uh, contaminated implant poses a greater risk to a patient than a contaminated device that's going to be in more transient contact with the patient. So there's a little higher bar for quality control on loads containing implants. So what they do in SC79 is that a PCD is used with a biological indicator, but that PCD must contain a type 5 integrating indicator as well. So the reason the type 5 is in there, it's just a backup plan for emergency release. If there's a scenario where that instrument or those instruments need to be used immediately on a patient and there is not time for, for to get the biological result, uh, even with these super fast biological indicators on the market today, um, it, 
the, the type five is to be used for that. That's the reason for requiring it in the PCD. And the reason, again, that they, they specify a type five is that of all the chemical indicators, it really provides the most information because of that BI relationship. So implant loads, chemical indicators can be involved with load release. So non-implant loads for steam um, is is, is optional to begin with. I mean, as far as doing PCD testing of a non-implant load, um, but it is a much more open, uh, much more open as to what you might be able to use there. So you can use a, a BI PCD for non-implant load, but there's also the opportunity to use a Type Five integrating indicator in a PCD or a Type Six uh, in emulating indicator as well. So a little bit more more options if it's uh, a non-implant load. So we jump over to ST58 and vaporized hydrogen peroxide. And here again, the external process chemical indicator is expected to be used on every package. And there needs to be a chemical indicator inside. Um, this, this, this standard does not have um, requirements regarding load release with chemical indicators. And a lot of that's because the ISO standard does not define type 5 and type 6 indicators for hydrogen peroxide. It's just a, a different process and a bit more complicated, and they just don't exist. OK. So now we're, we're at the point of, of talking a little bit of, of fact or, or fiction here in chemical indicators. So we've got three different scenarios that we're going to go through. So here's the first one. This is fact or fiction. Indicator tape can assess the quality of the sterilization process. Now I kind of hinted at the answer earlier, but let's let's dig into this a little bit and see see what the answer would be. So let's go back to the standard and look at type 1 process indicators. So this is the description in the ISO standard. And it says, as we discussed before, process indicators shall be designed for use with individual items, packs, containers, etc., to show that the unit has been directly exposed to the process and to distinguish between processed and unprocessed items. So that makes sense. We don't see anything in this description, uh, in the standard, that talks about critical variables or assessing the process. They just say this is what they're supposed to be used for. So when you dig into it in the standard, there are test requirements for type 1 process indicators for various processes. So I've pulled up again the STEAM example, but there are examples for the other types of processes as well. And they, they list out the requirements this way. So, excuse me, so there are still pass-fail cycles. You can kind of see how they're, they're broken up here. There are some very specific test times set there, which is different than we did on the stated value where the, the, the times are, are set by the manufacturer for each type of, of indicator. So test times are set, test temperature, and in some situations you got to see a pass as specified by the manufacturer. In some cases, you got to see a fail. So they've got a couple of temperatures covered, 121, 134. You see the last line is, is dry heat. So that's to, a test to see if, um, to, to ensure that you have to have steam present to, to get the thing to taint, change color. So the real key part of this, remember, is again, there are no stated value requirements, which means they, they're not directly linking this back to critical variables. It's, it's simpler. It's just meant to show you that, that the item was exposed. So going back to our original question, fact or fiction, indicator tape can assess the quality of the process. And that is fiction. So process indicators are not intended to measure the quality of the process. They're not specified that way. And the reason I, I bring this up is I know sometimes when there are sterilization uh, failures or problems going on, say with the steam sterilizer, 
I have had people say the tape looks great, you know, it's, it's completely changed color, so therefore the process must be good. And that's where some of that confusion comes in. So it's good that the tape changes color, that you can tell process from unprocessed, but you cannot uh, over amplify the amount of information that that dot or that, that indicator tape is telling you. Okay. So here's the, uh, here's the next one. Factor fiction. Type 4, 5, and 6 chemical indicators are all the same. So you can basically interchange them. They all tell you the same thing. Right? So let's dig into that. So we go back to the standard again and start with what, what does it say about them. So here's the definition of a multi-critical uh, multi process variable indicator. So two or more, um, and then the stated values are chosen by the manufacturer. So OK. Um, type 5, now we're going to all the critical variables. State of values are generated to be equivalent to or exceed the performance requirements given in the ISO 11138 series. And the ISO 11138 series for BIs is the biological indicator equivalent of the 11140 for chemical indicators. They're the standards that set performance and labeling requirements for biological indicators. The emulating indicator um, shall, be shall be designed to react to all the variables as well for a specified sterilization process. So first of all, when you, when you bring yourself back and look at the, just the, the definitions in the standard, you can clearly see that they're not the same. They're in, in words describing that these things are actually doing different things and providing different levels of information. So, let's let's pull some information again out of the uh, out of the 11140 standard. So the indicator type. So we saw this information before, right? So a type four, you've got the pass line, um, which is at the stated values, and the fail point, which is test point two at 25 percent, two degrees C. Now take a look at the at the type five. So. There again, at the stated values, um, it's got to show a pass. Uh, but the test point two, where it's got to show a fail, again, you subtract a bit from the stated value numbers, but it's not quite as much. So what it's telling you is that the type five is specified in this for this part of the specifications of being a little bit tighter, a little bit more specific than a type four. So you go to a type six now. And there, again, you're back to the stated values. But now you see uh, that even a little bit tighter on the test time, that you only drop the stated value 6%, and it's supposed to show a fail um, and 1 degree C. So a little bit tighter. And, and I would look at type 6 versus type 4 here, because both of those indicators have no stated relationship to a calculated biological response. And you can see how much tighter you will that the type 6 is than the type 4. You, it's got to show a fail when you drop the time 6% and the temperature by only 1 degree, whereas the type 4, you, you can go all the way to 25% 2 degrees C before you see a fail. So again, some evidence that these things are not, um, not all the same. So. We looked at the, the terminology and the comparisons, so let's just look at it this way. Type 4 responds to two or more of the variables. Type 5's got to do all of them. They got to have three stated values for esteem. Type 5, you got to have three stated values. And those stated values at 121, 135 for esteem um, have specific requirements in the standard, which I, I won't go into the super detail on that, but bottom line is there are established minimum stated values in the standard that correlate to a theoretical BI. So that's where that relationship is made between the type 5 performance and a calculated BI. So clearly a lot more information than what's in the type 4. And then finally, the type 6 also responds to all the variables, only one stated value, and it's intended to be cycle specific. So when we digest all of that information, what, what do we end up with? Um, the type 5, I highlight that because 
as we had said before, it, it is a bit unique in its requirements. It provides the most information um, because of the, the link to the BI. So back to our question, type 4, 5, and 6, are they all the same? That is fiction. Um, each type of indicator provides different levels of information. And again, the type 5 provides the most information. So one more. We've heard this uh, times. Uh, you can replace a biological or replace biological indicators with chemical indicators. In other words, another way of saying that is they kind of do the same thing and they kind of give you the same information. So you can use a, a CI where you where you use a BI. So let's let's dig into that a little bit. So we go to our definitions. Here's the chemical indicator again, test system, change in one or more of the process variables and chemical and physical change resulting from exposure and then the biological indicator is a test system with viable microorganisms. So these are the, the industry standards, international standard definitions. Right? So a couple of key things to look at for chemical indicator. It's the system that reveals a change in one or more pre-specified process variables. So they are linked to specific variables that, that we had learned about. So that's a key part of that definition. And then the response is going to be based on a chemical or a physical change of that, that chemical or that design being exposed to the process. So it's a chemical or physical type of response. If we go into the biological indicators, the operative terms here are they are test system containing viable microorganisms. So they are, biological indicators are the only system that actually tests the process's ability to kill organisms, which is the entire intent, intent of why you're running things through the, through the sterilizer. So there is a document uh, put out by the CDC in 2008 and then updated in 2015 called the Guideline for Disinfection and Sterilization in Healthcare Facilities. So a, a super, super reference document um, on this whole field of disinfection and sterilization. And there is a, a quote that I pull out from them because I think they have given the, the best information on the whole rationale for biological indicators and probably the best information to answer the question we've got on the table that you can replace chemical indicators, uh, replace biological indicators with chemical indicators. So the first part of it says that biological indicators are recognized by most, of, most authorities as being the closest to the ideal monitors, the closest to the ideal monitors of the sterilization process because they measure the sterilization process directly by using the most resistant organisms, bacillus spores, and not by merely testing the physical and chemical conditions necessary for sterilization. So go back to remembering that definition that we just talked about for chemical indicators, about them responding uh, physical and chemical to uh, having a physical and chemical response to the sterilization process. And then the second part of it is since the spores used in these biologic indicators are, the, are more resistant and present in greater numbers, then are the common microbial contaminants found on patient care equipment. So basically they're saying that the devices you're, you have cleaned and decontaminated and are, are now packaged and put into the sterilizer are pretty clean. Um, they're not sterile, but they're pretty clean. But the idea is that the BI, with its very high number of, of really resistant organisms that are placed inside there, um, is going to have a, a far greater challenge than what's on your patient care equipment. And then the demonstration that the biological indicator has been inactivated strongly implies that the potential pathogens in the load have been killed. So if the BI is dead, if the process is good enough to kill the BI, the process is good enough to have killed anything that's left on the instruments. So we'll come back to this fact or fiction. You can replace BIs with chemical indicators, and that is fiction. I think we've learned that biological indicators are the only indicator that actually provides a direct measurement of lethality. So we'll clo close today with a, just a quick summary. So we know that chemical indicators provide useful information about the physical chemical aspects of a sterilization process. They are 
they, they do that. They play a very important role in quality control testing of the processes. If you think about all of the different applications where chemical indicators of different designs and different types are, are providing information on the quality of that process, so they're extremely useful. And then you need to read and understand the labeling and IFUs for your chemical indicators. So you understand the information they're providing to you. So we talked a little bit about a, a manufacturer claiming compliance to the standard and the information that needs to be in there. Um, hopefully today you got a, a better grasp on what some of those labeling, uh, in, some of that labeling information means, you know, the types and such, and, and hopefully that's useful to you. So with that, I'm going to say thank you very much for, for your kind attention. Thanks for attending the Beyond Clean Prove It conference, and I think we should have some time now for some Q&A. All right, Craig, thank you so much for rounding out the Prove It conference for us. Hi, um, we do have a question. Yeah, welcome on, welcome online on webcam. Um, if anyone has an additional question uh, to ask Craig, you can enter it into the Q and A box on the lower left hand side of your screen. Otherwise, you can certainly feel free to email your question to Craig Lee. Uh, also, when you watch this conference, uh, any of these sessions on demand, if you enter questions in even during the on demand viewing, they will get to the speakers. So feel free to utilize that option as well. Um, Craig, just a quick question for you: Do you have an example for what a Type Six chemical indicator would be used for? Um, so the the application is as I had uh, mentioned in there. So it's typically going to be an, a pack indicator um, is going to be the most common use, and so people will use it for the same thing you would use a pack indicator for on the inside of the pack. the The key um, is to you know what we covered today is to look at that to make sure you kind of understand what that tells you. So the, the type six is supposed to be a cycle specific indicator, which means it is um, supposed to sort of guarantee that those parameters were met. Um, actually, the, the, the problem with that is that you, you don't account for come up time with type sixes, so they're not quite as, uh, quite as reliable. But the, the bottom line answer is they're gonna be used as internal indicators, except uh, in STEAM, I mentioned for loads that don't contain implants. Um, they are also allowed to be put inside of PCDs for, uh, for those cycles as well. Okay, very good. Thank you so much for providing that additional information. Everybody, we have come to the end of the Prove It conference, a spotlight on sterile processing quality. Greg, I want to thank you so much for joining us twice right, today and providing such great information to our attendees and our audience. Yeah, Brett, it's been a pleasure to co-host with you. It's it's fun getting to work next to you side by side every day, but um, this is something new and different, co-hosting a virtual event, and it's it's been fun to shake things up a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. It's been a great time. Uh, I've learned a lot from you. I appreciate all your coaching and everything. And you know, it's it's interesting to be on the other side with being on the vendor side and presenting. You know, it's a total different experience as, you know, opposed to hosting. So it's been great. It's been fun. I've learned a lot and looking forward to the next one. Agreed. Agreed. And everyone, just as a reminder to get your CE certificate, you will be transferred automatically to the conference survey. So if you want to just, um, you know, get that over with before you start your weekend, feel free to fill out that survey and you'll be able to download your CE certificate. If you do want to come back to the survey later, um, you can access it during or access it via the Beyond Clean Credit Hub. Um, so either option is great, but you will need to view all seven sessions, complete that survey, and you'll get your certificate. Uh, as the day comes to a close, a special thank you to all of our speakers and our conference sponsor, 3M, for helping us make this day of education possible. I'd also like to recognize all of you, the professionals who reprocess surgical instruments across the globe. For all of you who chose to spend your day with us, um, educating yourself, um, we'd like to thank you for your dedication to professional development and best practice. Um, like I mentioned, at the session's close, you'll be redirected to the conference survey. All of today's sessions are available to watch on demand. So if there's one in particular, a couple hopefully in particular that you want to share with some colleagues of yours, 
feel free to send them the access link. Uh, you can come back to these sessions and uh, access those downloadable resources. Definitely check out that bonus content that we added to the downloadable resources about a really exciting announcement about the first ever sterile processing micro-credential uh, collaboration between Beyond Clean and the Competency and Credentialing Institute. Brett, it's been awesome. Thank you for being a great co-host with me today. And everyone in sterile processing, stay safe out there. And as always, we encourage you to keep fighting dirty. We'll see you all next time. Thanks, everyone. Happy Friday.